1988, my relations with dad plummeted. While he was in Afghanistan with the Mujahideen, I learned that I had failed my three A-levels, achieving only O grades. I've been at it for nine years now. Mum told dad on the phone, at my insistence, hoping that by the time he got back, he would have softened up a bit. My mum and I went to pick him up at the airport, and he had been away for almost three months at this point. And he came and he, you know, he hugged my mum and whatever. He said, nice to see you. Didn't say a word to me, just completely ignored me. And we went over to the car and, and we were driving back home. And halfway down the journey, he looked at me through the rearview mirror and said, you know, what the f are three O's? And I didn't quite know what to say. So I said, well, yeah, I just got 17 O levels now. And he said, you know, why should I waste my money sending you to university? Why don't you just start working at the office from tomorrow and, you know, you're useless, basically. And I then begged and pleaded and my mum begged and pleaded with him to say, look, send me to university, give me a year in university, let me do journalism, which is what I really want to do, and if I don't prove it to you in a year that I can get good grades, bring me back. And he eventually relented and sent me. And I did get the grades and I did get a a degree with honours. I'm not, I'm not a parent, uh, but I thought he, he treated your education in the most cavalier, ridiculous manner. Well, he used to give me receipts of all my school fees, just so that I wouldn't <laughs> know how much it what cost me. What a waste me. of time it was. <laughs> just so I would know how much it cost me. I, he expected it to be paid back to him at some point in his life. Well, isn't that pathetic? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we never went on holiday. We went on kind of working vacations. You know, he would go to the game parks, he would take us to the game parks, he would take us to Mombasa uh, for a beach holiday. But we would never go anywhere where he did not take his cameras. So for him, it was a working holiday. He still got up at five in the morning to get the sunrise. We made the mistake of going one holiday where my mom insisted that he doesn't take his office with him, which is all his paperwork, um, and his cameras, and we managed to get through about four hours in Mombasa before he said, you guys enjoy your holiday, I can't do this, I'm going back. And he left us there, and he went back. And that was him. He treated me worse than I think he treated anybody else in his staff when I worked at Camera Picks. Uh, I think he wanted to make sure that there was absolutely no favoritism at all shown toward me. At our Chester House offices, I spent my most miserable years. I found life behind a desk here almost unbearable. Well, I wanted to go out and shoot and, and do things outside of the office, but he would, he moved on to this system of dictating letters by the dozens every morning from three o'clock in the morning. And then he would give me this tape with a pair of headphones. And I would have to sit there and type all these letters out. And it was mind-numbingly boring stuff. Uh, it's more that I, it's, it's the most I got to hear the sound of his voice in my entire life, because that's all I heard from 8.30 in the morning to seven o'clock at night was typing these letters out. He communicated with everybody by memo, including my mother, including all his staff, uh, including me. Everything was in writing. He told people, do not talk to me, do not tell me things in the corridor, do not tell me things at the breakfast table, do not tell me things when I'm walking out the door because I don't remember. So just write it down. If you want more money, write it down and I'll give you a response. If you want to go somewhere, write it down and I will respond. So there would be a sheaf of memos waiting for him because he went to bed so early, so we would write our memos at night and leave them for him on the dining room table. Then he would start working at four in the morning. So by the time he left, there was a sheaf of replies to all of us. So we'd go through that. And it was the same in the office. Every member of staff had a tray with their name on it. And every morning there would be these memos in the tray. 
He had everything in paper. It was all in triplicate. It wasn't just one copy. It was in triplicate, so he never forgot. And I, you know, I made the mistake of you know, taking him up on that one time and saying, well, you never told me. And he pulled out this file, which had all the memos, and he pulled it out and said, well, here's the memo. Can you not read? I fell in love with Fazana in my early 20s, but Dad would not hear of us getting married. He felt Salim was too young. Salim was probably about 23, 24 at that time. He had just come back from college, no work experience. And I think he just didn't feel he was ready to get married at that time. The other thing was, I mean, religion. Uh, well, I'm Ismaili. He's a Muslim Punjabi. And Fazana is a Shinashri. Both our fathers were not happy, so I was trying to deal with mine. He was trying to deal with his. And I think eventually, after a lot of persuasion, he says, fine. We knew Dad would get to the wedding just in time because luggage started to arrive in the middle of the festivities. Dad, of course, had been away on a job. But suddenly, the great man materialized out of the darkness. There he was, the hero, returned from the front line to celebrate his son's wedding. And he didn't have a clue what was going on. Though he tried, Dad was not very good at weddings. His own was proof enough. As for music and dancing, it embarrassed him. His body language said it all. As with family holidays, he couldn't get away quickly enough. So you're going to stick them together? No, no, no. Yeah, <laughs> oh, we can. <laughs> no, the two shots. So finally, after a bumpy, fractious engagement, Fazana and I were man and wife. Dad couldn't resist giving a running commentary. I hope it's extra large size. <laughs> <laughs> It looked as if Dad had finally acknowledged that I had come of age. We were not to know that within 18 months I would lose him and Mum would be widowed. I've got a beautiful son. I've got beautiful two granddaughters. I've got a lovely daughter-in-law. She really, really look after me. They are my family. But... Uh, there is a loneliness in me, you see. I feel lonely. But, but when I think of it, I think that even when Muhammad was alive, I was still feeling very, very lonely because he used to, I mean, he, he never used to be at home, you see. Salim's day probably begins at 8.30. He'll come for a quick lunch for probably 15, 20 minutes, go back to the office. On a good day, I'll probably see him back home at 8 o'clock in the evening. On a bad day, he'll come home at 8, have a quick dinner, and he'll probably work until 1 or 2 in the morning. That is hard. That is hard. I find it difficult to deal with. As head of the family now, I have this fear that I'm following too literally in my father's footsteps. I swore that I would not miss my daughter's birthdays and be there when they're growing up and I have missed them and I haven't been there. So I, I, I'm worried that I'm going down that same path. So I need to put things in place which will enable me to spend more time here at home. But will I be able to? More importantly, do I want to? Or will the same demons that drove Dad entrap me as they enslaved him?